Archie had claimed the Caraways were normal folks, but I still couldn't imagine Stargirl coming from an ordinary home. I think I expected a leftover hippie scene from the 1960s. Make love, not war. Her mother in a long skirt with a flower in her hair, her father's face framed in mutton chop sideburns saying groovy and right on a lot. Grateful dead posters, psychedelic lampshades. So I was surprised. Her mother wore shorts and tank top as she worked the pedal of a sewing machine with her bare foot. She was making a Russian peasant costume for a play to be presented in Denver. Mr. Caraway was on a stepladder outside painting window sills. No mutton chops. In fact, not much hair at all. The house itself could have been anyone's. Glossy bentwood furniture, throw rugs over hardwood floors, southwest accents, an Anasazi-style an wedding vase here, a Georgia O'Keeffe print there. Nothing to, be, to proclaim, you see, she came from here. Same with her room. Except for Cinnamon's blue and yellow plywood apartment in one corner, it might have belonged to any high school girl. I stood in the doorway. What? She asked. I'm surprised, I said. At what? I thought your room would be different. How so? I don't know. More you. She grinned. Stacks of fillers? A card-making operation? Something like that. That's my office, she said. She let Cinnamon out. He scurried under her bed. This is my room. You have an office? Yep. She stuck her foot under the bed. When it came out, Cinnamon was aboard. I wanted to have a place all my own where I could go to work, so I got one. Cinnamon scampered out of the room. Where is it? I asked, or I said. She put her finger to her lips. Secret. But I know one person who knows, I said. She raised her eyebrows. Archie, she smiled. He was talking about you, I said. He likes you. He means the world to me she said. I think of him as my grandfather. My inspection yielded two curious items. One was a wooden bowl half filled with sand colored hair. Yours? I said. She nodded. For birds looking for nest materials. I put it out in the spring. Been doing it since I was a little girl. I got more business up north than here. The other item was on a bookshelf. It was a tiny wagon about the size of my fist. It was made of wood and looked like it might have been an antique toy. It was piled high with pebbles. Several other pebbles lay about the wagon wheels. I pointed to it. You're you collecting stones or what? It's my happy wagon, she said. Actually, it could just as well be called an unhappy wagon, but I prefer happy. So what's it all about? It's about how I feel. When something makes me happy, I put a pebble in the wagon. If I'm unhappy, I take a pebble out. There are 20 pebbles in all. I counted three on the shelf. So there's 17 in the wagon right now, right? Right. So that means what? You're pretty happy? Right again. What's the biggest number of pebbles ever in the wagon? She gave me a sly smile. You're looking at it. It didn't seem like just a pile of pebbles anymore. Usually, she said, it's more balanced. It hangs around ten, a couple to one side or the other, back and forth, back and forth, like life. How close to empty did the wagon ever get? I said, oh, she turned her face to the ceiling, closed her eyes, once, down to three. I was shocked. Really? You? She stared. Why not me? You don't seem the type. What type is that? I don't know. I groped for the right words. The three pebble type, she offered. <clears throat> I shrugged. She picked up a pebble from the shelf and, with a grin, dropped it into the wagon. Well, call me Miss Unpredictable. I joined the family for dinner. Three of us had meatloaf. The fourth, guess who, was a strict vegetarian. She had tofu loaf. Her parents called her Star Girl and Star as casually as if she were a Jennifer. After dinner, we sat on her front step. She had brought her camera out. Three little kids, two girls and a boy, were playing in a driveway across the street. She took several pictures of them. Why are you doing that? I asked her. See the little boy in the red cap? She said. His name is Peter Sinkowitz. He's five years old. I'm doing his biography, sort of. For the tenth time that day, she had caught me off guard. 
biography. Peter Sinkowitz was coasting down his driveway in a four-wheeled plastic banana. The two little girls were running, screaming after him. Why would you want to do that? She snapped a picture. Don't you wish somebody came up to you today and gave you a scrapbook called The Life of Leo Borlock? And it's a record, like a journal, of what you did on such and such a date when you were little, from the days you can't remember anymore. And there's pictures and even stuff that you dropped or threw away, like a candy wrapper. And it was all done by some neighbor across the street, and you didn't even know she was doing it. Don't you think when you're 50 or 60, you'd give a fortune to have such a thing? I thought about it. It was 10 years since I had been six. It seemed like a century. She was right about one thing. I didn't remember much about those days, but I didn't really care either. No, I said. I don't think so. And anyway, don't you think his parents are doing that? Family albums and all? One of the little girls managed to wrest the banana roadster away from Peter Sinkowitz, and Peter started howling. I'm sure they are, she said, snapping another picture. But those pictures and those moments are posed and smiling. They're not as real as this. Someday, he's going to love this picture of himself bawling while the little girl rides off on his toy. I don't follow him around like we did Clarissa. I just keep an eye out for him, and a couple of times a week I jot down what I saw him doing that day. I'll do it for a few more years, then I'll give it to his parents to give to him when he's older and ready to appreciate it. A puzzled look came over her face. She poked me with her elbow. What? Huh, I said. You're staring at me really funny. What is it? I blurted. Are you running for saint? I regretted the words as soon as they left my lips. She just looked at me, hurt in her eyes. <clears throat> Sorry, I said. I didn't mean to sound nasty. How did you mean to sound? Amazed, I guess. At what? I laughed. What do you think? You? I laughed again. I stood before the steps facing her. Look at you. It's Saturday. I've been with you all day, and you've spent the whole day doing stuff for other people, or paying attention to other people, or following other people, or taking pictures of other people. She looked at me. The hurt was gone from her eyes, but not the puzzlement. She blinked. So? So, uh, I don't know what I'm saying. Sounds like you're saying I'm obsessed with other people. Is that it? Maybe it was the angle, but her fawn's eyes looking up at me seemed larger than ever. I had to make an effort to keep my balance lest I fall into them. You're different, I said. That's for sure. She batted her eyelids and gave me a flirty grin. Don't you like different? Sure I do, I said, maybe a little too quickly. A look of sudden discovery brightened her face. She reached out with her foot and tapped my sneaker. I know what your problem is. Really? I said. What? You're jealous. You're upset because I'm paying all this attention to other people and not enough to you. Right. I, I'm jealous of Peter Sinkowitz. She stood. You just want me all to yourself, don't you? She stepped into my space. The tips of our noses were touching. Don't you, Mr. Leo? Her arms were around my neck. We were on the sidewalk in front of her house in full view. What are you doing? I said. I'm giving you some attention, she cooed. Don't you want some attention? I was losing my battle for balance. Uh, I don't know, I heard myself say. You're really dumb, she whispered in my ear. Yeah? Yeah. Why do you think there are 18 pebbles in my wagon? And then the last remaining space between our lips was gone, and I was falling headlong into her eyes right there on Palo Verde after dinner. And I can tell you, that was no saint kissing me.